It's uh, 1206, Board of Trustees Technology Committee meeting. Um, Erasmo Caso Chair, Dr. Sylvia Atkinson, uh, Vice Co-Chair, Minerva Peña members he is here. Uh, thank you, Drew Brown and uh, Philip Cowan for also being here. Um, call this meeting to order. If, uh, if we would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, Texas flag. Under the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and individual. Item three, presentation of BISD Future Ready Educational Technology Action Plan, phase one. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, during lunch, thank you very much for coming out here uh, to do the technology committee meeting today to go over several things. First and foremost, uh, I want to thank uh, all the board members that made it out here. And um, we have a lot to, off, uh, to show you today. And we're going to do everything in our power to use the what's called the multiple intelligence, which is the visual the audio, and everything that it takes to kind of understand uh, the plan development and why it was developed. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let you know that uh, the law, a lot of the laws have just come out, and one of the laws is Stephanie on here on legislation. And that law that you see, it's, you're going to see it in part of your presentation. But one of the things that I would like you to see that in by 2023, if you look at one of the bullets up here, and you have this in one of your tabs, but for now, I just want you to see up here, by 22-23, uh, you're going to have completely online testing in all content areas. So I want us to think about that, that in, by 2022-23, um, there's going to be complete online testing. Okay? So we know that, but what are we doing to make sure that we're facing into that, to that preparation? Okay? And that's one of the things that I also want you to think about. The other law that I want you to think about is the, uh, the other bill that you're also going to see in your packet. It won't be discussed to its entirety, but I would like you to see it, and that's Senate Bill 1839, and that you will find also in your packet. But Senate Bill 1839 is, going, is saying that all the new teachers that are coming to BISD will be required to have digital literacy certification. They will also be required to know all their Easter standards. Easter standards. Um, as you know, we'll be taking some teachers over to, uh, teachers, principals, administrators over to the Easter conference. Um, thank you very much for the approval, Dr. Hatton, everyone that supported that. But all the new teachers that are coming out here, they are going to be required to have a digital literacy certification and they're also gonna have to master the ESTA standard. So that's something that I want you to think about as we introduce to you the phase one plan uh, of our, our presentation today. The reason it's called phase one is that in order to have a five-year plan, you have to have a basis, especially the focus on instruction. Um, I know infrastructure is, is important, access to digital devices, but the main heart of everything is the instruction and how we're going to focus on that instruction. So when you look at this plan, I want you to keep that in mind um, and just understand that every single activity that we did for phase one is just having the basis for all the seven gears. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the first item, and that is your, your uh, phase one plan is on your packet as well as on by board, um, I'm not sorry, not by board, board book. It's also on board book. So if you wanted to see that, I didn't buy it anywhere, I promise. If you wanted to see this anywhere else, uh, you'll definitely see it on your board book in the future. But it's also in our website, it's in our ISET website, and it's an icon that allows you to see it at any time. This has also been shared with our principals as they're doing their improvement campus plan. Um, we're asking that they look at this plan as well. We had numerous meetings. Uh, as you know, the last time we, we came forward to you, we wanted to show you specifics of every plan. And we had leaders and co-leaders at every committee. There's seven committees. So we had leaders and co-leaders. And today, you're going to get to hear from the leaders and co-leaders present today. Um, one of the things that I want us to think about is in, in your packet, you're going to see on page six. So I want you to look at page six, and this is one of the things that we've had to really study hard district-wide. 
And what we needed to understand is that not everyone is ready to jump on technology integration. And it could be many reasons. It could be skills, it could be, you know, they're nervous, they, they, they really uh, prefer a different type of learning style, but teaching style, but I want you to keep this in mind. We have a high group of innovators in this district. Uh, we have a lot of uh, early adopters that whatever you offer them, they will come and do this training. They will go, they will try it, they'll go to a conference, they follow through. So we have a lot of uh, early adopters and then we have a lot of early majority. The majority of our teachers in our campus, they just need the opportunity and understanding how is this gonna enhance instruction? How is educational technology integration, digital literacy gonna enhance instruction? And when you show them how it does that and students already that are in the classrooms know that and you do pro professional learning communities, most likely you're gonna have 50% of your teachers on board. It is the ones that are late majority and the laggers, the ones that, man, do I really have to use uh, technology integration that we're having to really understand what can we do to build that, that human capital that is needed for the 21st century. Uh, if you look at your college readiness skills, the number one thing it says is that when a student graduates, they must be very aware of multiple platforms, and not just one multiple platforms, the word is multiple. So just keep that in mind, we have the teacher and we have the student. I believe our students are all innovators, early adopters, they will pick up anything and know how to teach us. It is our teachers that really need the support. It's a, it's a concept of what's called the theory of change. And theory of change starts with focus on your innovators, focus on your early adopters, get the early majority and the rest will follow through. So just keep that in mind as we're also doing this plan. Right now, you're all welcome to go to our summer camps. If you look at the next page, you have our timeline. We have three summer sites going on right now for teachers. We have the Google training at Monsanto. We have the Microsoft training at CAB that happened on Monday. And we have the uh, ELO integration of all platforms here at the Technology Lab too. And believe it, we have uh, numerous teachers showing up, taking this training. We even have principals showing up, deans showing up to these trainings. So it's been very rewarding to see uh, how they're welcoming these type of summer sites for training. As well as our digital literacy and, and many of our programs that we're doing in our summer school programs as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first leader for the first committee. Uh, Dr. Cuff sat in the curriculum and instruction and assessment and he'll be uh, doing this part. Thank you, Mrs. Rubio. Um, board Chair, Mr. Castro, Board Vice Chair, Dr. Atkinson, and Board Members. Um, in your handouts, you, I believe you have either on your board book or you have a hard copy of this. So what I would like to do is take you through the curriculum instruction and assessment piece, if I may. Do we want to show that snippet? We're going to show you a quick snippet, and then we'll proceed. Well, I think you will see self-directed learning in most of our classrooms because students understand now how important it is for them to uh, take ownership of their own learning. And when I go into the classroom, I call it the magic in the classroom because I don't see a teacher standing there talking, lecturing. I see activity. I see students collaborating. I see students doing, you know, applications like Minecraft where they design in the high school or I see them doing experiments you know virtually or I see them taking virtual field trips all around the world and you know that you have opened up their learning opportunities and they have taken ownership of that they are in control of that they feel powerful they feel much more uh, responsible to themselves we're asking teachers to go a step further use more rubrics use more performance tasks things of that nature to truly assess but also don't forget about the qualitative qualitative nature of assessments. It's not about quantitative all the time, the numbers. It's something about how students feel, how they, how they are uh, interacting and how they're learning and how they're growing. I insist that the evidence be diverse because you cannot rely on one particular mean or mode to describe what's happening now. It's too transformative. You gotta look at a variety of assessments and methodologies in determining how effective this is. And the most important to me, thing to me is how does it affect the student personally and what's happening with them emotionally and in their heart and in their desire and encouragement to be better and to learn and to grow. That's the most important thing to me. 
Now, if I'm going to prepare a student for a 21st century job, if I want them future ready for a job that probably hasn't even been created yet, I need to provide them with skills more than content. I need to, I need to move from being a content expert to being a gatekeeper of that content. Does that make sense? I need, to, I need to teach them how to navigate and access that information properly and safely and in, a, and, and, and in an intelligent way. You know, we're teaching students how to research, but instead of going to a library, they're, they're, they're learning how to do it online. Technology does allow for incredible transformation in those learning processes. The students would use the technology, uh, in this case the tablets. Okay, we just wanted to give you a little bit of a snippet on that and we'll proceed on. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, guide you to page seven, if you would. I'm not sure on, on my hard copy and uh, in your board book, but anytime you look at education and where, we are, where we're at and where we're going, you have to look at the vision. You have to look at uh, our educational system and you have to look at where we want to be, not only today, tomorrow, and in the future. And by doing this, we have to set a vision for BISD, for our students in BISD. And uh, I'm not going to read that to you, but I do want to point out some characteristics or some points in that paragraph on vision. You know, all too often you walk into a classroom and you see rows of chairs in, in line and the teacher in front lecturing. That's something we want to get away from, that lecture model to innovative student-centered models that empower students. We want to give them the power in the classroom to move forward. We want to have active listeners in the classroom, um, uh, active learners through multimodal teaching and learning. We want student agency will be facilitated through authentic, hands-on, experiential learning that is driven by inquiry and guided by educators through technology-rich environments. And, and that's the key, is to integrate the technology that we have today and the technology that's going to keep coming and coming towards us. Because it changes every day. Look at where it's been five years ago to today. In the classroom, not so long in the past, we used to buy computer on wheels called cows. Okay. Now they are being displaced by what? iPads. And now we've got iPads in, in second grade. So we're moving towards greater and newer technology every day. So, with that, the goal, align and redesign curriculum, instruction, and assessment to engage students in 21st century student-driven personalized learning. And I will let you look at the key elements before. I won't read those over. But I will, <clears throat> I will ask you to turn to page eight. And we have basically three components. That's nine. And I'll start with the, the component on page eight. That's nine. I'm sorry. Nine. I have page eight on mine. It's nine for us. Nine for you. Nine for you. Okay, that's fine. And on this one, what we're, well, again, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. I'm going to say that on this one, what we want to do is increase accessibility with everybody. That means our students, our teachers, our parents, anyone connected to that classroom. So that's our goal. I also want to remind you that this is a live and breathing document because there's going to be changes. We'll be updating, we'll be deleting, we'll be adding as we go. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that. What we built into this on the right side is, and I really agree with this, is formative and summative assessments. Formative assessments are, are that you test as you go. You don't just wait till the end of the year and then bring some document in to test. So we want to see, we want to like teach a little test, teach a little test. And this is what we're going to be doing with this area as well. Um, when we talk about increased accessibility to technology-based instruction through hardware and software, what we're looking at, and you can read that in the middle, we're looking at a multi-platform um, engagement where we're using Microsoft, Google, and Apple and hardware at the campuses for computer technology enhanced instruction. Think of it this way. When we go into industry and we're, we're preparing our kids for post-college work or post-high school work, we want to look at what specific is for them. For engineers, engineers, if you're going into, and I'm just going to give you three areas. Engineers, they look at using windows and workstations. If you're going to be an engineer, um, 
if you are going to be dedicated in like K-12, then we're going to be looking more at Google, okay? Yeah. And those that may be going into graphic design, video, audio, processing, and related fields, Mac. they're looking at Apple. So we have to prepare our kids, Google, uh, Apple, and um, Windows. And Windows. So we, our kids have to graduate with a good, solid background, a good, solid background. If I could take you to the next page, which I think would be page eight, page 10 with yours. This is the second area, addressing the gaps in teacher skills necessary per, for personalized, personalized learning. We, um, curriculum instruction needs to make sure that they partner with professional development. Big, big issue here. Um, so that the needs of the students and the staff are met. Teachers need to understand what personalized learning is. We all learn differently in this room. I'll bet everybody in this room went through elementary, went through junior high, went through high school, but we all had our own way of learning. Some are kinesthetic, some are audio, some are visual. So we have that background, but we have to prepare our kids in the, in the way of technology, and that's what this is, this is uh, tied into that. So that's on uh, page 10. On page 11, <clears throat> we're addressing the gaps in student at risk and dropping out through adaptive personalized supplemental learning. We have to create lessons that are going to be created for them that they can use in the classroom. Uh, we'll look at different platforms that differentiate uh, lessons for the students and that's very important. That's very important. In a classroom, you have students that might be high, middle, low, but just to teach one way is not going to work. You've got to meet the needs of the individualized students through technology. And we have systems in our classrooms that adapt to the level of the students. Example, in elementary, you've probably heard of Smarty Ants. We use Smarty Ants at the elementary. And that's good because that adapts to every student's level. At the high school, we use uh, Nuslet, um, Nucella, I got to get the accent right on that part. Nucella, and we're using that at the high school. So those are just two examples of what we're doing. But both of those adapt to the students' needs and their learning. So that is in the curriculum and instruction assessment. Again, I want to uh, reemphasize that we'll be probably monitor. We will monitor this, and we'll make ad uh, adaptations as we need to, because it is a breathing document. And we'll learn, you know, at the end of the year, we'll probably come back to you and say, you know what, this worked, this worked. We can add more to it. This did not work. Why didn't it work? And then we'll come back and talk about that. So lots of, uh, this is a, a work in progress and it's going to evolve and we're going to work with it. But it's a great document. It's a great thing for our kids in our classrooms in BISD. So, any questions? Dr. Atkinson. Yes, and I'm not sure if this is, uh, Dr. Hatton, this is for Dr. Cuff. It may be for technology, I'm not sure. But uh, it has to do with the what, what we said we would do by June 2019 in our district improvement plans and our technology plans. Are you looking at me? Well, <laughs> Dr. Hatton. I don't know, I'd probably refer yeah. that to one of them. So, well, I'll, I'll give you the specifics. Is there we were going to be uh, making sure that we had uh, our bring our own device initiative mm -hmm. was going to be measured by the end of June 2019 and uh, we also had that our three-year our three-year technology plan was going to be evaluated by May 2019 and the last one was of course was our fifth grade students uh, we would have an evaluation by June 2019 presented so those are the thing and I know a couple of means before I asked about where are the reports that we would talk about the uh, success, critical success factors that are supposed to be in play and how we're evaluating our success. Those are the first three areas. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's go with the, the, the bring your own device. Um, in one of the tabs, you're going to see uh, civil in the, one of the agenda items, it's gonna talk about how many teachers are allowing students to bring their own device 
to the campus. It's an individual report by school. I gave you two examples on the second. I think it's a, I think it's on the agenda item for one to one device, and I'm showing you what each teacher turned in to talk about uh, what are they doing to allow schools to uh, have students bring their own device and what are we doing to do that. We've been working with the technology. So when we get to that agenda, you will have a lot more conversation about the bring your own device because I even gave you an example of what it looks like when teachers turn it in. And we also have to turn in a composite report as to what are we doing as a district to make sure that we're allowing the students and do we have policy in place. I know that uh, Mr. Fisher and Todd Nichols is also working, worked on allowing students to use a certain type of uh, uh, domain that doesn't allow them to filter into our own, um, uh, such as a, a free Wi-Fi. So w we'll get to that part and we'll be able to do that, but I can do it as right now if you'd like. Maybe if, if you might need a bird walker just uh, just in, in, in effort to try to ma maximize, I guess, our time, uh, maybe that's a, a good opportunity for her to just mention that um, so that it'll maybe curb questions towards the end. Kirk. Um, uh, but just because it came up again last night on program evaluation, I think Kirk had a real good point. And where curriculum technology, you know, uh, merged in these type of areas, it's important for us to always be data driven on the results. And so when you talk about your T-PESS, uh, you talk about your T-TESS, you talk about test scores, the star charts, all those type of things. One of the things that I mentioned at the budget meeting was making sure that our district improvement plan, our technology plan, and the plan that you have all intersect, right. you know, so they complement each other. And Dr. Hatton uh, had said you all would make sure that was something that was going to get taken care of. And, and just to respond to that, um, just the start the the star chart no longer exists from TEA mm -hmm. so we use the US Department of Education framework which is the future ready framework mm -hmm. and we looked at the way we're going to be assessing this teachers where they rate do they rate beginner intermediate mid uh, mid where do they rate mm -hmm. um, and the US Department of Education uh, provides a lot of samples of frameworks such as the TPAC model mm -hmm. and the TPAC model has a survey for teachers and the teachers get to determine where where do they stand okay uh, we also printed out every single campus by teacher as to what type of uh, trainees that they attend that were technology based mm -hmm. and each teach each principal uh, the ones that went to our first training they got the package by teacher mm -hmm. I believe that as a result of that and the result of the need to continue training that's why we have the summer camps so going back to the action plan that's on the per per personalized learning you have the goal of aligning the star chart well the star chart no longer exists with TEA so we're using the US uh, the United States uh, not the United the the US Department of Education framework which is very rigorous mm -hmm. um, and in order to meet those standards okay it's because one of the the second uh, item off of your technology uh, for the district improvement plan the strategy of course is to make sure that all teachers get 12 hours minimum of technology development and so that was the other report that by June 2019 we would receive that we're in, that we have met yeah. that requirement. Uh, I'm glad you June 20, which is I believe June 2019 is what it said today. Well, 2019. no. 2019. Okay. 2019. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so what tomorrow. we did. So you have a day. Okay, I have a day. Okay, <laughs> I have a day. I have 24 hours. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I have actually we have actually printed oh, out every single one. <laughs> every single campus by every single tech teacher by every single training they did so what we did is we had a presentation with the principals and we put a notebook with every single one I can no. bring you I can bring you a report what I wanted summary, to do summary uh, but let me tell you what I wanted to do <laughs> right? yes. let summary. me tell you what I wanted to do I wanted the principals to have a chance to look at it first mm -hmm. so they have this summer camps to infuse you need to go and let me tell you, it was packed yesterday at Monsanto. Mm -hmm. And it was due Good. to the leadership Good. of the principals that looked at the reports and mm -hmm. say, you're lacking three hours, you're lacking six hours. So I have it by individual campus. Mm -hmm. Do we have some teachers that are lacking? Yes. Do we, do we need to increase? Yes. So we're doing Cyber Saturdays, Tech Thursdays, Bash. But I, I can assure you that that goal is our priority mm -hmm. because without the teacher training it won't infuse in the classroom mm -hmm. yes so I have 24 hours thank you very much no 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 they said that's 24 hours but the, two months ago we talked about just performance standards and making sure that you get back to us and again it came up again last night 
on program evaluations. This is an area, and it's this technology service. That's why I asked originally, uh, or initially, you know, who was who would address it. it? I didn't think it was really maybe a Dr. Cuff question, or even you, because it's at technology services in terms of the reporting. So yes, and, and I have the reporting, okay. and I, I have Perfect. all of them upstairs by campus. Okay. And what I can maybe do is, summary, I just give you a summary of each one of them. Okay. But I'm very thankful that you even asked for this because in order, <laughs> I, I'm thankful that you asked for this because it takes top leadership, it takes the board, it takes the superintendent, it takes all of us mm -hmm. to, to do a check and balance. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to improve student instruction is through that process. Mm -hmm. So we have individual presentations. Some principals have already received them. They literally went through the training to see it. You're also gonna see that uh, a Hugh Newitt presentation by uh, Missy, uh, um, Garcia. Ms. Garcia to help those teachers that didn't reach the 12 hours so they okay. have the summer to finalize that. Okay, great. Okay? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. We're going to have the next section is our uh, use and tape uh, space and time. And we're only going to show you snippets of the video, not the whole, just, just a little bit, and then we're going to go just straight to the goals. Mm -hmm. Can Mr. I Castro. make one other comment real quick? Okay. Mr. Castro. Mr. Rubio, on the district improvement plan, when you all get ready to, to go forward, it still indicates it's that you're going to go through the star chart surveys, okay? So when you go to the plan for learning for the 1920, you can correct that. I'm glad you're telling me that because I was very involved with doing that. But you're they're, they're all there. Uh, it's on there, our website. Where's doc, Dr. Renfro? I sat with Dr. Renfro. It's right there. <laughs> uh, oh, maybe on the different website. Maybe yeah. you've seen that in the IT website. Well, but it, you won't see it the on the ISD. ed US. Okay. We will look at that because for the plan, plan for learning, I was very involved with making sure that the I line item say the word transition since star chart no longer exists. Mm -hmm. So thank you it's for right highlighting here. that. Okay. Okay, Mr. Castro, um, members of the board, Dr. Haddon, I'm here to cover the use of space and time. Uh, this was actually David Mitchell's gear, but uh, he retired, so uh, he's not going to be able to cover that for us today. Uh, so I, I work closely with him, and I know specifically what the needs are for this gear. Uh, mainly, it's changing the, the mindset of how we learn, right? Uh, in the past, we had a traditional way of learning, right? And, and if you look at the past, we equate books to learning, right? And there's, there's a sage that gets up on in front of a classroom and delivers that learning. Well, nowadays, there's so much learning going on. I mean, if you check with your kids, where do they learn things? Is it through a book? I, I hear kids saying, well, I went to YouTube and I learned something, right? So, so that's changing the way we learn. And use of space and time wants to respect those needs that students have, not only students but teachers, so that they have flexible anytime, anywhere learning. And we have um, a move to com competency-based learning as well. And you're going to see that some of this overlaps with curriculum and instruction and personalized learning. Okay. So uh, let me move on to the video. I'm going to play a quick snippet. The transformation of space has completely elevated student engagement. How do we provide the environments that kids need, sometimes to be in their caves and be private, sometimes to be at the watering hole and working in small collaborative groups, and sometimes in cross-pollination where they're able to really share their work and work with each other. My kids love to be under things, behind things, around things. We have five gallon buckets in my room that we sit on. We sit on crate seating that I made in my backyard out of a crate and some plywood and some foam. And I also just threw a lot of pillows on the floor. Offspring is like a baby, like a baby squirrel. Is that something that might be important to your research? It might be important. From day one, I've said, you may sit anywhere you like as long as you're safe in our classroom. Okay, so we've seen a lot of this happening at schools, right, where there's flexible seating, uh, kids have bouncing uh, chairs, that that way they can um, alleviate some of that extra energy they have. You had a, you had a question, Mr. Gustavo? Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, some of the strategies here that we're working with, uh, we have leveraging human capital. Now with this one, uh, again, Ms. Rubio mentioned it, we have early adopters, we have innovators, and we want to take them to be the models for this type of learning, right? We want to take them and work with them so they have a system 
where they receive personalized instruction, where they receive, uh, where they use their space and time to get hours. So maybe not everyone learns at the same time or at the same place. And with this, uh, teachers are going to be able to learn through the Who Knew It system, through other systems that we have available so they can receive their PD at their own time. Okay, so um, the next strategy, that's page um, 14. We have extended opportunities for learning. When kids take their device home, right, if, if there's district issued devices, like in elementary we have iPads, and when the kids take iPads home and they use Smarty Ants, they use uh, Education Galaxy and Prodigy Math, we've seen gains because they, they are more true to that need where they have fidelity that they need to keep. So when we only have classroom time, there isn't enough time in the day for fidelity. But when they get to take it home, these kids are so excited to get coins and points in these game-based systems that, that they keep going the extra mile to get that work. And this really helps out, especially the ones that have those uh, gaps in their learning, right? It addresses those students, the bubble students that, that are in between. It really helps them. And then we have uh, the third strategy. It's providing job-embedded authentic learning in, in the fields of aerospace, in the fields of coding and robotics. So uh, that's defining how we use time as well, right, and the space that we need. In a classroom, we, if we have rows and rows of desks, we're not going to give space for robo robots to be interacting, right? What if kids want to have a robot battle? Well, we kind of need to redefine how our spaces look, how our libraries look. And I know there's great work being done with libraries right now, so that's something that plays in, into this gear. And those were the three strategies for, the, for that gear. Are there any questions? In regards to the flexible seating, I, I mean, I've seen it in some, in some of our uh, elementaries, in some of our schools, but not necessarily in all of them. Is, is it something that we're moving towards, or is it something that uh, we're slowly getting there? You will see that from, from school to school, from classroom to classroom. Um, and, and to continue <coughs> with, with that statement, we have uh, a lot of it has been teacher driven. They went to Donors Choose and uh, requested from Donors Choose the, the wiggly chairs and yeah. carpets and rugs. This is right now a live project that's up there by one of the teachers at Aiken. And they're requesting the wobbly stools. Right? So a lot of it has been sort of grassroots movement with teachers. And then st principals started picking up on it. But if you, if you remember the theory of change, you notice that not everyone does it at the same time. You have the innovators, you have the early adopters, and those are the ones that start the trend. So eventually, if, if we respect that theory of change, we'll know that we can't just push it onto everyone at the same time, right? It grows organically and naturally with those that, that are already on that bandwagon. So that's what we see here with, with donors choose and teachers being very proactive and acquiring some of that funding for those so, and, and if we get more principals to support it, then we'll, we're going to see it grow in an organic way. Okay. Okay. okay so the next person to present will be a robust infrastructure. Um, we have Ms. Okay, Chacon. Video. And before, and then, and then Todd. We have Todd and, and Ms. Chacon, and we're also going to show a snippet of the video. Before we get too, we as IT, uh, K-12 ed tech IT professionals get too happy about having a wireless network in place, let's be one step ahead of that and think, well, how am I going to keep that wireless network up to date? 
as we deploy thousands of iPads every summer and literally thousands of Chromebook carts and are continually in the upgrade process of, of replacing Macs and PCs, uh, what we did is we, we looked to our students and we typically hire anywhere from 10 to 12 high school students every summer and they do the whole project from soup to nuts. We train Apple certified technicians over at our Innovation Center and that's certainly a big part of our uh, high school uh, student support program. And then at the younger grades, at the middle school level, uh, our schools have geek squads where they're really the first line of defense before an adult gets involved in the tech support process. Um, our community support is critical to that. Back in 2008, we passed a bond that allowed us to install fiber optic links between all of our schools and our, um, our data center. And at the time, it was one gigabit links. Our local municipal government offers a 10 gigabit backbone. And so we upgraded our local area network bandwidth from one gig to 10 gig and saved over $100,000 doing so. But our city is actually very helpful with uh, offering wireless access. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patricia Chacon. I'm the elementary principal uh, at Palm Grove. So once again, um, Mr. Castro, Ms. Atkinson, and board members. Uh, on my end, as an elementary principal, I think the infrastructure is, of course, very much important that we understand um, the depth and complexity of all that uh, because as we focus on curriculum and instruction and working with our upper grades making sure that we meet our starting needs and our goals as a district and our campus and then working with our lower grades and making sure that we're ready and building them uh, for success um, as far as our infrastructure um, we're changing the way we learn yes and creating new learning environments and as we know online testing is coming up really soon and as we uh, start thinking very carefully about um, our inventories, uh, what devices do we have? What software programs can they support? Uh, going back to um, computer labs, you know, where we used to have or we still have those computer labs and how old are those computer desktops um, to our cows computer on wheels and we wheel them back and forth and, and uh, the cost of that uh, to maintain and um, keep up with the battery usage and purchase uh, a new device or do we just buy the battery for it uh, to iPads and so um, which is the cheapest or which is the best way to go. Um, and so coming up um, on slide 16 and, and slide 17 moving on to our rubric we went we want to make sure that we develop um, a rubric that's going to help me understand at the campus level oh, I'm sorry yes at the campus level um, how am I going to budget um, what investments should we be making at the elementary level or at middle school high school as a district um, to support the department on our own needs um, and so which devices do I want to uh, make sure that we uh, support our students with? Going back to what Dr. Cuff said earlier, um, from iPads to laptops to Chromebooks. So and so as a parent, I'd be really much interested to know all these details because I want my child at that campus. Or I want my child at that district, in that district. Um, and so, for example, um, I know very popular with even my own son uh, is the Minecraft software. Well, Minecraft only works on, on devices that support Microsoft 10 and so how many devices at Palm Grove where I'm at will support something like that so all those students in my community deserve just as much or even better why not um, and so uh, as we move forward with looking at um, um, the one-to-one -one device as an example on the next slide um, 18 um, and so I want to make sure that we do get to that goal, one-to-one -one device, and, uh, and we leverage our human capital so that we know how to be prepared. Um, it's not just buying the device, it's also supporting it with professional development, because how is a teacher going to be able to put that into practice? Otherwise, um, I, I myself, as the principal of the campus, need to make sure that I reach out to CNI, to uh, Technology Services, to uh, Ms. Rubio's department, uh, I said, and make sure that um, I develop um, a, a good system in place to make sure that we're keeping up and, yes, requiring the teachers for ongoing training uh, technology specifically um, and make sure that we're ready to imp implement 100%. Um, and on, and in addition to that, on slide 19, 
um, connectivity issues. And so from all the way down to Palm Grove, down south most where we, uh, we are at, uh, to Lopez Early College High School, all the way to Veterans Early College High School. Are we connected? Do we have a lag, as, as some people say, you know, uh, it's taking too long to load. Um, what's the problem? Well, it's, um, we need help, technology services coming over, um, over and over again, or every so often. And so what's, what's wrong with um, our Wi-Fi, s or is it, or is it the, devi the devices? I've learned to understand that it's not necessarily um, an issue with technology services per se, it's maybe my device, it's um, an old one. I need to update, and so going back to the campus, uh, how many old devices are, you know, and how much is it going to take out of our budget this year? Or if it's, is it something that can be supported through Ms. Tolman, who's helped us out? Or is it going to be something that we're going to have to tackle at this campus over years? Um, and then how long is it going to take because online testing is coming up around the corner? Um, and so um, the goal, as I'll close on my end, um, going back to the beginning, um, in slide 16, our goal is to ensure that all our administrators, uh, our staff, our teachers, our students, and yes, of course, our parents, that we all have equitable access to our technology devices. Thank you. Board chair, board members, Dr. Patton. Um, we do work with the campus. We do listen to their concerns. Um, one thing we do, too, is work with the funding source because the funding source is very important to the campuses. I know some of the campuses may not have the funding within their local budget. So again, sitting down with the funding source, sitting down with the campus, looking at their needs, what they currently have as far as what technology they have at the campus. Because if you go from campus A to campus B, there might be some different uh, types of devices that are there. Um, we are only as fast as our slowest device. So as she mentioned earlier, if you have a device that's an older device, when it connects to the Wi-Fi, it may run slow, but if you take, for example, board members, you all got new iPads, I bet they run a lot faster than the laptops that you had previously. So that's, that's what we're working with. We're working with newer technology, and in some cases, the older technology trying to connect to the new Wi-Fi. So we do need to work with the campus, you know, especially when it comes to online testing. We want to make sure when it is testing time that they're all connecting um, at that moment. Um, we are very fortunate. We do have a local 10 gig fiber network. We are connected 10 gig to every location, every campus. So we're already there, as it mentioned in the, the snippet that was on there. Um, when it comes to the testing devices, you know, any platform across, you know, we've worked with PAM. We want to make sure that we go through PAM, uh, Miss Raven's way. You know, are you going to allow that device? If we get the go ahead, we're going to get it ready, so we want to make sure that we do that. Um, and again, we do support all devices. Um, another misconception sometimes is cell phone service versus Wi-Fi service, because sometimes at Palm Grove it's the cell phone service, but we know, you know, if there's a call or a question, we go out there and take care of that issue. Um, BYOD, I know that was mentioned here just a moment ago. We do have a policy in place. You know, if there is a BYO device, um, it is allowed in. Uh, but the concern there is security, number one. You know, what device is that child or even a teacher bringing in? We want to make sure that it's segmented off our educational network with uh, viruses. You know, that's first and foremost. So we'll take a look at those devices. And that goes back to, if it's an older device, it may slow down the network. Because every time somebody hits a Wi-Fi, it's one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. So again, we'll look at that. that. So any questions on the robust network? Yes. I, um, I remember when we gave out tablets to mm -hmm. fifth graders a while back, and it seemed like our control, we had issues with controlling and also making those work. What are we giving out now? iPads? Are, are kids getting iPads? We're not using anything but iPads? Is there's iPads, there's laptops, you know, newer laptops. Mm -hmm. I think going back to the fifth grade initiative um, probably four or five years ago yeah. with Ms. Tolman, I, at that time, you know, Wi-Fi wasn't as spread as it is now. And so we've readjusted where we placed the access points. And I think what I'm interested in is control of the devices too. Do the, oh, do we the do. kids take things home or no? Or There are some devices that do go home, yes, and so they are filtered. Okay. device called Zulu Desk and Zulu Desk allows you to monitor the device wherever it's at. 
they, uh, the IT department, before the device goes into the campus, they make sure that it's active, and it's a $17 purchase per device for lifetime. So we will pay for one time, and if the device gets broken, they allow you to transfer it to another device. But it's a lifetime license, and parents now get to, uh, if, if the device goes out uh, to the camp, to home, parents now have access to an app that allows them to even see what the kids are seeing in their laptop or device. So we have control of where they go, we have control of what they're looking at, we have control of, of everything that is happening with that particular device. No, if I may. No, these devices that are going home are not for the lower level students, they're for the upper level students? It could be any level. It could be second grade, it could be fifth Fourth. grade, it could be a high school student, it could be a middle school student. Uh, right now in, in Christmas we had the winter wonderland and all the iPads went out wow. uh, during second grade. Uh, for second grade students and we now have more principals that are allowing the device to go home uh, it all depends on how ready they, they feel uh, about letting them go but it takes time and so far so good so far so good I mean we've we actually have had one that came in broken and one that that the parent is asking can I buy it from you you know because they really enjoyed having the child use the device but they've been very good about bringing it back very good about asking how else can I have it for extended time how well are we doing in the high school level with the sprint? Um, the the ninth grade students really love it. They they love the increase of, of access to more space and usage. Um, and I wish we could do more next year. Unfortunately, the the one million project is so many went on applying and so many people are applying in the state of Texas now that more schools are being accepted minimizing the numbers that we're going to get for sophomore juniors and seniors but for the freshmen they enjoy it maybe we had some parents that said mm, uh, they need a little bit more training on how to uh, use the the tablet at home they need a digital literacy lesson on you know how to use you know social media stuff like that and so it's very interesting to see some of the parents coming back and say I grounded my daughter. She's not allowed to use this device. Uh, it'd be surprised. And then we have some that say, is there any way that my son that's coming in eighth grade can use it? So we have a mixture of, yes, I'm excited, and some saying, mm, it, it's okay, we, we keep it at school. On the uh, fifth grade, just to follow up on her question, uh, and two points on it. One of them, I understood that uh, uh, we were going to phase out the, uh, I think, the Khajiit tablets. What are they going to be receiving in, in, in place of those? That's one question. And the other one was uh, when we first bought the Khajiit uh, and we were looking at other devices and the ones they could take home, uh, the district had an initiative which would allow the parents to buy the tablet. At a, after a certain point, maybe it got a little old and they could, the kids could buy it. I don't know what you would sell it for or whatever else it is. And so is that program still going to be into effect as well? Let me tell you, the Khajiits, after we had several meetings and a lot of concerns that were addressed, many of the principals opt to move the Khajiits to second grade and first grade. They use it more for digital literacy, for literacy development, more for the phonetics uh, and different platforms that for a lower level. Um, the Khajiits, uh, really right now, if you look for them, they're in first grade or maybe even kinder, okay? And they're spread out uh, among the teachers. What we have replaced the fifth grade with is they have laptops, and some campuses have laptops and iPads in the classroom in fifth grade. Um, when you see one of the reports that I'm going to show you in one of the agenda items, you're going to see that the area that we really have least amount of devices is in fourth grade. We have enough in first, second, we have enough in third, uh, fifth, but it's in fourth grade, and that's the area we want to focus on because of many of the writing assessments that are coming our way is all online. So that's it's exactly what's happening right now. We gave autonomy to the school principals, and the majority opt to put the Khajiits in the lower grade level. Yeah, just to follow up a question, well, some of these devices, well, what's the normal lifetime? How many years could you expect to be? I know that the old iPads that came out 12 years ago or 15 years ago are still you know, usable, but what's the lifetime that we can expect to use these things? It just depends. I mean, I'll, I'll let Todd answer, but I, when I was a bilingual director six, seven years ago, we purchased iPads for many of the bilingual classrooms. They're still there. And so it just depends many on the devices and, and the way they're taken care of as well, you know. Uh, just, some, just something I'll let uh, just ask. Yeah. It really comes down to usage. You know, typical lifespan, three to five years. You know, we really want to see the five-year. 
Uh, again, like some of the older iPads, you know, don't have as much space as the newer iPads, so we cannot put as much as wanted by the campuses, but they are repurposing in them in another way at the campus, but typically three to five years. Ms. Brown? Todd, I wanted to ask you, I, do you all still have high school students uh, repairing and setting up computer labs and all that? I know some of the campus, especially I know at Pace, um, Adam Shoup over there has done a very good job. I know over at Hannah they've done a good job. They've recruited some of the kids. But as far as a specific program, I cannot say that they're doing that. But I know that some of the high schools, they do recruit the kids to help them. Uh, with some of their technology but at you campus. used to have a program within yes, your department in fact my son worked in that and it was, yeah, a, it was a grant y'all don't had, do that anymore it was a grant that we had and no it's not being funded anymore through us I know that we've had a partnership with TSC where we've had some of the students come in because they've done an internship with us uh -huh. and they've gone out to the campuses too I thought it was a great program. I really do. I do want to add to that. I, I met with Dr. Hatton, and, and she came up with some proposals on district-wide pre-K through 12 uh, cyber techs at every campus to teach kids from kinder all the way to 12th grade. So we're looking for having a sponsor at every campus. The sponsor will be with the students. They will teach the kids the basics of Wi-Fi security, the basics of helping the teachers, uh, and we would give the teacher a stipend, and we're going to be monitoring that through our Title IV uh, initiative that we want to do. And what Dr. Han would like to do is see something that's more global to be this, the engineering, the SpaceX, something that will grab the student to say, I want to be part of that. We had a coding, uh, in educational coding, and we asked uh, all the kids if they thought they were the best IT to please come to, to the stage. Almost everyone wanted to run and say that they were the best IT person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when they went to the stage and they spoke, a little kid literally said, I, I sit in the back, I am the IT person for the teacher. I don't know why the teacher doesn't know how to use technology, but I am there to help the teacher. I am the best IT. So we have a competition going on. Next year, we're gonna have the best IT for every elementary school, one best IT middle school and one best IT. You'd be surprised that kinder, first and second graders are so interested in this field. And so if we get that support on sponsorship, um, Pace High School, is willing to model their, their program. They have kids that go to Stell Middle School and they go and fix the computers, help the teachers. So we're gonna use that model to uh, develop all the way to kindergarten. President Pena. Oh, go ahead. Oh. And I, I was just gonna piggyback on that because we have excellent students yes. that run circles around a lot of the professionals. Okay. And the reason I say that, I'll just leave you with this. We had a high school student graduate from Porter High School years ago that we had you know, viruses go into your computer when you're illiterate and you accidentally open a site and you get a virus that tries to destroy your iPad or your computer, you gotta like wipe it out to get the virus out of your system. We have kids that would come in and get rid of that virus and challenge themselves to kick that virus out of there and not destroy any of your files. And these are kids that were self-taught, so they exist because yes. that's their calling to them. So I'm glad that I'm hearing that you're using them because I, I had one experience where a child, I caught a child who was in high school, came and cleaned the virus off of a system that we had in the computer at home, and he took him about seven hours, and he stayed in the dining room seven hours. He started at 10 o'clock, and he refused to go home because he refused to let the system beat him. So we have kids that are very, very involved, and I'm glad that I'm hearing that you're doing that, and whatever you need for us to do to make sure we build that up, I mean, that is a plus for our community. Right. And we were in the stages with Dr. Han and getting a, a, a just a very uh, concise, uh, w in the question was, do you want to be an engineer? Do you want to be a, a, a NASA? Do you want to, and if you are interested in this, this is the, the team you want to be in after school. This is definitely hands-on. So that will be coming your way soon. Mr. Cowan. I, I just wanted to follow through with the, on the, the business of these iTech captains and, and I forget the exact term that you use for them. We're going to have this competition because I was asked uh, to show up at uh, kind of a little competition they had with robotics and some other stuff uh, on short notice because nobody was available. And my office is only five blocks away from the cab. Yes. And, and I, I showed up. And, uh, you know, it is a totally different leadership uh, model uh, with these kids. The, you know, they step up, they're in the fourth grade, and 
I'm going to do it. I'm going to show my teacher. I'm going to get it. And I'm going to help the other teachers. And it really, I mean, you know, it's just something totally different. You know, you have football, you have sports, you got baseball and the other stuff. And for people to exercise leadership. But here is somebody who takes, you know, brains and then they, they and, and it's not a, a type of thing of showing off. They love the sharing, which I, I just found just incredible. The kids, they take the leadership and then they know something and then they share it. They share it with a teacher if the teacher is not quite up to par. They share it with their friends, and they kind of compete and they gig each other a little bit to see who can be better at it. You know, and I, I was just very impressed with the whole thing. And there was what 500. There was over five, six hundred students. About six hundred students there. You know, and totally competitive. I mean, it was just incredible the amount of interest that there was in this. Right now, we have TSC camps, and the number one slot that what got filled was cybersecurity, uh, with Apple coding. And it was great to see 50% girls, 50% boys in this camp. And so we had a waiting list and of people wanting to take this cybersecurity and, uh, and coding. So the demand is there. And I can't imagine having a kindergarten, first grader, helping the teacher, being the one that I'm the IT for this classroom. And from that one IT, we're going to have one IT per campus. And from that one IT campus, or we're going to compete as, as an elementary, middle school, and high school. So you should be seeing that competition next year. And hopefully it's all positive. Uh, any other questions so we can go into the next ones? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Rubio. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. The next area is very, very important. Uh, it's probably one of the most crucial that needs to be added and, 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 and really discussed in our curriculum, and that's data, data and privacy. I'm going to give you just a small snippet of that data privacy. Um, so that What is student data? You may not think of empowerment when you think of data, but when used effectively, Data can give you the full picture needed to support the incredibly important education goals of parents, students, educators, and policymakers. That said, there's a lot that must happen before data can be meaningful and useful to everyone. Student data are collected from many sources and in many formats, although the type of data and who can access them is different at each point. But what do we mean by student data? First, there's academic information student growth, courses, grades, enrollment, completion, and graduation. Then demographics, students' age, race, gender, economic status, and special education needs. There's testing, results of teacher-designed tests and quizzes, and annual and benchmark assessments. As well as student actions, attendance, behavior, extracurricular activities, and program participation. Plus, data generated by teachers, observation and engagement of students in the classroom. And finally, data generated by students, homework and learning data from apps and online tools. To get that full, clear picture, important requirements must be met for information to be truly useful and to empower people. Data must be there when you need it, provide a whole picture of student learning, and be relevant to your needs. Data has to be safeguarded, trustworthy, and kept private. Educators and policymakers need to have the knowledge and skills to use data effectively. Data should be used to communicate with families and communities about how students and schools are doing. And data must also be used to help leaders and educators support and improve learning. The right data, in the right format, used the right way, empowers students like Joey, supportive parents, dedicated educators like Ms. Bolin, and visionary policymakers with the information they need to make decisions and take actions that lead to student achievement. It boils down to this. Student success depends on empowered policymakers to allocate resources and craft important laws. Student success depends on empowered teachers to design effective instruction and individualized lessons. So you have an idea of what this is so crucial is that making sure that now that we have access to a lot of the data platforms that it's secured that we make sure we have filters and not anyone can obtain this at the same time one of the areas that we're really working on here is developing digital uh, citizenship we talk about behaviors uh, but we don't we need to focus on focus on a lot of digi digital citizenship whatever the kid posts publicly stays that's a print of that person and we try to tell their students you know what kind of preparation are we giving our second graders that now use iPads and whatever they post on Seesaw, whatever they post on a platform, it is a print of the student. So one of the things, our goals for this gear is to make sure that every single student next year has a video, a presentation, 
and an agreement that they understand what digital citizenship is all about. So this is what two several things you're going to see here. You're going to see number one, identify data and data systems. On page 21, what might be your page 22 is review and update policies all the time, making sure that we're aligned with legislation. Um, and at the same time, what are we doing to secure the safety of many of students? One of the areas that we don't talk about is data and privacy is de definitely cyberbullying. And we do need to have a policy making sure what are the consequences and that these consequences are very transparent to parents and students. But data privacy can be in many formats, as you saw right now. But the digital citizenship is the most crucial. You can't access information that doesn't belong to you. You can't post anything that, um, that will affect you or anyone else. And this is something we got to to really work with our students. And we have a lot of cases um, where parents say, well, how did they get access to the internet? How did they get access to that information? Or how did, they, how did that uh, information get communicated? So we have great systems in place. Um, last year, I think Mr. Arambula uh, came with the policy and making sure that we, what were the, be the consequences? Uh, anything that you see um, uh, data that students have access to has to be monitored at all times by teachers and I know that uh, Mr. Nichols anytime uh, Todd Nichols every time somebody gets into any information he, he finds a way how it happened and makes sure that it, it doesn't happen again so we have a great and Mr. Fisher as well always uh, going to the cases pr uh, pretty fast and making sure that everything is secured so this is this this part any questions on this the next one is community partnerships. Mr. Garcia. And we have our, our we have our leader and our co-leader, Mr. Granado, who is a community member. Mr. Granado. What we are doing partnering with the K-12 school is making sure that our students understand the variety of options and opportunities are there. We, with the partnership with the K-12 school administration and faculty, created various pathways. For example, we have computerized numerical control, agricultural science, health sciences, just to name a few. And that is to tap into the aptitude and the interests of the students. So it's not just about classes anymore. It's about there is a goal to be attained. And it's not just graduating from high school, it's not just graduating from a community college, but it's lifelong learning. That way the student know that when they take a class, there is a connection to something else down the road. In my seventh graders, they have a class called Design and Modeling. And so we go through the design process and, and how to read blueprints and different views, and then they design those views and they make things and then we get on a 3D 3D CAD software. We have had a few make some prototypes for things that they, they wanted to and in the welding class him and his group wanted to design a bike rack. And I showed him how to use the program and he used that to design a bike rack and then we printed that off and then they took that prototype that we printed off and his set of plans and all that to the city council and they're gonna plan on um, implementing some of those bike racks around town. We have a center with the Howard Wynn School District. It has been in place. Good afternoon, Mr. Castro, Dr. Atkinson, board members, Dr. Hatton. And uh, our community partnership, uh, I, have my, uh, I also have to give credit to my colleague, uh, uh, Ms. Larasquito. I have uh, Mr. Noe Granau uh, from the community. But uh, in our strategy descriptions, number one, community partnerships for innovation and ed tech, uh, we've, been, uh, we've already uh, have been working for the last couple of years with Housing Authority, City of Brownsville. I, I took the, they had sent me something this morning, so I forwarded that to you by email. A little video about uh, a project called Home Connect. And so what they do is uh, for the, uh, our different housing sites across the uh, city, uh, they're able to take a small group, about 18, 20 parents. Uh, they usually, those parents bring in one or two kids, and these are from our schools, and they'll do a three to four hour training, uh, how, to ac how to use the device, how to set up the device, how to use the device, and then they take them to the different uh, departments at BISD. And then after they complete the three, four hour training, uh, that family signs off and takes the device home, right? So Housing Authority is one of our key partners, uh, 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 GBIC, uh, the, uh, the city, the county, uh, they've helped to either do uh, support letters and so forth. 
help us to leverage uh, grants which provide technology, for example, for the uh, police department. But the district will increase community partnerships uh, focusing on entrepreneurship, innovation, strategic planning that will facilitate educational technology. And moving to page 24, our second strategy, uh, we'll collaborate with local uh, Chamber of Commerce to network with local businesses to provide students with presentations, entrepreneurship, and soft advanced skills needed in the workshop. So I know that with the uh, advent of P-TECH, uh, uh, several folks, uh, including the, uh, the hospital, uh, CK Technologies, you know, we'll start out small with uh, doing, uh, uh, doing some field trips, having folks from the uh, hospital and from CK and other technology uh, areas come to the schools to do presentations uh, as we move on. Also, I wanted to uh, note uh, the, in the partnerships, uh, both TSC and UTRGV are, are, are major uh, players in uh, us developing uh, our partnerships. I know that uh, earlier someone said about how students learn and how some of our teachers are teaching the way they were taught. We do have a couple of graduates from the UTRGV Biomedical Sciences. So day one, when they come into the classroom, they want to teach flipped classroom because that's the way they're taught in the biomedical science program at UTRGV. And so that's been going on for about six, seven years, maybe more, right? So those teachers come in and that's how they feel comfortable. So we've got to teach them, okay, well, once in a while you might want to, now some of those folks are incorporating additional strategies. Uh, not, to, not to hog up all your time, Mr. Renau, would you like to say something, uh, especially uh, about some of the technologies that are out there well, hello everybody. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Noe Granado, a uh, previous employer for Brownsville ISD uh, for over 12 years uh, in the classroom and um, now a community member. Um, as I exited, I also became a national trainer for classroom management and a consultant for how to integrate technology into the curriculum because um, I love it, <laughs> right? Um, and as everybody was talking, I was just writing notes like crazy and the number one thing that I've picked up after going to so many districts and, and uh, going through the RGV is how they're changing education to self-education where now students are really learning on their own and coming back and then picking up on, on what the teacher has to say or, or maybe do it during instruction. I also picked up a lot where we need to figure out um, or we're, we're, that's what we're doing as I go to different districts and even especially in BISD. But what is the superpower of every student in your classroom? Because you have that student that loves mathematics, that loves social studies, that loves history. Let them you know, grab a group and teach that group, and then you facilitate the process as it's happening. And education happens a lot more when that's happening in the classroom. Um, and that brings back to, I think somebody said about how the classroom seating arrangements happen. Um, there's also a theory on how the classroom settings should be set in the classroom, and that's um, even uh, different ways of setting the classroom. Are you going to set the classroom where everybody's pointing to the door, so when the door opens, everybody turns and looks at the door, or are we going to set the settings where it allows the teacher to walk around and then facilitate the instruction during the classroom? So uh, I think Dr. Cove brought it off, uh, brought it up, and that's a real, like, very important on how to set the classrooms, um, settings in the classroom. There's even, there's even a theory that I've learned throughout the process as doing this, is there's a vanilla extract, uh, what they use when they put uh, in the doctors, the, when you're going through an MRI, they, they let go of this vanilla extract so that you're not too nervous or too scared uh, when you're going through the machine because there's a real strong noise. Well, that's been, um, that's been used in the classrooms. As students walk in, they're smelling this vanilla extract, calms them down in case they're hyper, and then allows you to do instruction. It's just all these little things that make a difference in the classroom. But that was one that, that, I, that I wrote. And, and then I heard, I think it was Ms. Ruby or, or, or uh, somebody said that teachers are going through different trainings. Well, guess what? In your classroom, you have students that have that superpower that know a lot more about Excel than me and you do. <laughs> Let them host an hour or two during whatever time during the class, during school, school hours and the teachers that are off can go and let the students do the training. Let them show them how to do something a lot quicker that takes them you know, hours and now it takes them like minutes to do. So that's just an idea that as a community member, 
um, when I if I have my kids coming to school and they're saying, "Man, I just taught a group of teachers to do this," and I'm like, "Wow, you know, it's just just wow." But I'm just as a community member, I like to bring these things on what students and what I kind of show my kids to do, in the, and you know, when they're in, at schools. But oh well, thank you for your time, and I hope this was meaningful, some way. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Noe. Yes, and moving to strategy description three, right? Uh, uh, we are creating a database, right, of leaders, uh, expertise in technology, both within the district and outside. That can be uh, that we can uh, leverage for partnerships. On, pa on page 26, uh, global partnerships. The district is beginning uh, to create a global partnership utilizing globalschoolnet.org. And, and then you can see the various people that are helping us uh, with that strategy. And on page 27, let me just make sure, 25, yeah, 26, 27, we have strategy description five, the district will create partnerships with the city of Brownsville to ensure new space entrepreneurial academies are extended into the classroom through uh, clubs and partnerships. Mr. Castro. Yes. Can can we, by any chance, if there's anyone else has questions, I mean, I actually went through this yesterday okay. at the backup. Is there any way that we can get to um, 3B so that we can talk about the uh, the department and some of the some of the con the okay. concerns that we said we're going to get addressed at this meeting? Thank you. Thank you. If you if you just allow me to finish, we're going to do one slide and that's it. We're not just you'll have the videos on your own so you'll be fine so let's go to the next one which is personalized learning and I just one minute personalized learning you all are gonna have an account for you knew it um, if you just one. so again uh, I was the gear leader for this one and Ms. Deyanira Garcia was the co-leader uh, personalized professional learning there's a few key elements right that uh, teachers, leaders have, have a type of learning that is catered to their needs. And with a system like Who Knew It, they're gonna be able to choose their own professional development. So the system, the Who Knew It system is here. So with, with this, they can go in and receive hours um, on their own time. And what's better than, than just receiving hours on their own is that they have a chance to really select what they're passionate about because m more than, more than ever, we need to be very personalized with this. Uh, instead of giving them a, a one-size-fits-all type of a, of a PD session, here they go and choose something that's specific to their needs. Uh, too many times we have math teachers who say, well, this isn't the training that I was looking for. Here they can find the specific training that they need and receive you know, the skills that they're looking for. And in our very last uh, module that we have, I do want to give credit to uh, Dianita. She has done all the work to make sure that she knows every technology training that has been conducted by teacher, by campus, and credit for her. The next one is budget and resources. Uh, we've been looking in alignment, make sure how do we maximize our human capital. And our final last one is co collaborative leadership. It all starts at the top. It starts with leadership. It starts with our board, with our superintendent, with our, our assistant superintendents, our teachers. And when we have all, we're all eager to continue focusing on this, it definitely uh, supports the entire campus. So that is definitely our plan. Um, you have the plan in the ICIT department and you have the plan and board book, okay? This concludes this section. And I wanna thank you for your time for allowing us to present this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, 3B presentation. 3B. Uh, please. So on 3B, if you look at that area on 3B, you're going to see uh, the 2023. I have a uh, page there for you. But you're also going to see the, the Internet Access and Devices form that we have to turn in every year. And that form, if you can look at uh, your page there, it will show you. Um, it asks a question. Is there a school connected to Internet through a fiber optic connection? Does the school have Wi-Fi? Does the school allow students to take homeschool issue devices? Does the school allow students? devices every year we have to turn that in at the back of the document you're going to see the teachers have to monitor how many devices they have uh, per grade level and they have to determine what is their percentage so every principal has to know what is their percentage and it is through this report that we saw that district-wide um, they were missing the uh, they were missing 
how they are with the one-to-one -one percentage. And some schools are at 70, 90 percent, some are at 30, 40 percent, and those are the schools that we're working with. So that's, that's two. So you wanted three. 3B. Dr. Atkinson, you wanted three, right? 3B. Uh, th three B the presentation comparison, educational technology staffing among large school districts in Texas. Okay, okay. So let's go to this one. Um, if you look at this report that you have here, this report is the reason it is a very difficult report to really master is because every single district had multiple names for positions: software engineer, network engineer, technician, help desk. And uh, if you look at this. Um, you would notice Brownsville ISD, if you look at the entire report. Yeah, make it, make it smaller. If you look at the entire report, you're going to notice in this report, um, and I even gave you an organizational chart. That's too small for me. Yeah, let's make it a little bit bigger. Make it at 75. There you go. I, okay. If you look at your report, you're going to look at Brownsville ISD. You're going to see the IT area, and you're going to see the ed tech area, which is two different areas that we work with. The reason you have numbers everywhere is because everyone had different names or different responsibilities or, or they, the positions overlap. So if you look at Brownsville ISD, they have 34 uh, positions. And Todd, if you'd like to add to this, uh, 34 positions in total, I believe 34 to 36. And for the ed tech area, we have three. If you look at Harlingen, they have five in the IT and they have eight, uh, three in the ed tech. If you look at Socorro ISD, they have one chief technology officer, six help desk, one coordinator, one E-rate. You can see that yourself. Network specialist, you have computer technician, 15, software development, 11, total 48, and they have 12. And I copied, I, I put their uh, organizational chart because they um, really uh, specified what position. Uh, they were the ones that had a very, very solid between IT and ed tech um, and to show where, where, where's their functions, what's their positions, and how many did they have. They have 45,000 students. You have Edinburgh, they have nine and one. You have Alif, uh, three, five, four. They have 27 in the IT department and they had eight in the ed tech department. PSGA had 23 and four specialists, 27, and McAllen, 32. Um, in EdTech, they had five, and you can see their titles. In San Antonio, Chief Technology Officer as well, 42, and 446. Isleta, Chief Technology Officer, you have 25 and four, 29 in total. United, Executive Director, Information Technology, 11 and 10. Edgewood, Technology Director, Mr. eight. And this is your all your numbers. Uh -huh. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Grosso? Yes. A question here, uh, Dr. Hatton. Uh, since I know you work, you've worked very closely with Dr. King. Obviously, if he's got 27 overall and about the, basically the same population that we have, student counts about 45,000, and he's spread out over four cities basically. Um, is there a, a is there an opportunity to maybe better align if they're at 27 and and we're at 37? And I don't know if people can hear you. We have uh, we have met with PSJ several times this year. Our technology staff have traveled to uh, PSJ ISD to look at their model mm -hmm. and to look at uh, how we could operate more efficiently on, on, and maximize the ed tech support. I did meet with technology this week. Uh, we're going to. We've kind of came up with an organizational structure that will be proposed to uh, the incoming superintendent, but we we do need to to show some uh, our better balance in here, and we don't have as many programmers as they do. So they also prioritize their resources and how they utilize them. So uh, we we will have a plan and a strategy for looking more like uh, like these other large districts in the state. Mm -hmm. So just to follow up then, Dr. Hatton, so you're saying at this point we're looking at being able to maximize what we currently have, but not so much adding to it. Absolutely. If we're adding, it's going to be on the ed support side, not anymore on 
um, the business support side or in the networking pieces of the org chart. Okay. That will be looked at uh, with the new superintendent comes in. We are uh, hopefully posting a chief technology officer position next week uh, after the plan is approved. And that will be one of the priorities that Dr. Gutierrez has established for the district moving forward, looking at alignment of the technology department and establishing clear priorities with the new uh, chief technology officer. And how can we add uh, support on the ed uh, tech side. We we haven't posted the chief technology officer because it's a position that has not been approved, but hopefully will be on Monday evening. And just keep in mind that it was a very uh, interesting uh, process. A lot of the departments in, in many of these districts, what we notice, they have the media specialists under their department or they have uh, a, a total different, uh, M, like in one of the districts, they had a one MIS director, one informational director, and one chief technology officer, and, and that would be PSJ. And so they, they have a, a, a different kind of leverage when it comes to the supervisory role. And then, of course, many of them did have a chief technology officer. Any questions? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, you would mentioned that you had uh, included the organizational charts. The only one I see is from Socorro. I only included Socorro, and the reason I included Socorro is because they are the only ones that are delineated by person and name, uh, the position and by name. The rest of the school districts gave us pieces, but it only had a name. It didn't have specific, like, okay, I'm the network. It just said these are all the staff members that we have. So what we did is we, if you notice on the top, it has all these different names up there, network specialists, web, we, we included them as we were speaking to okay. them. And, and the only reason I mentioned is because if PSJ, like I asked Dr. Hatton to reiterate, if PSJ is the one that we've been bringing in and we said we we're gonna try to align and model, that would have been you know, one that would, I think would have been helpful to, to uh, look at. So if Dr. Hatton, maybe you can, you can send that to us as a, follow up? I will. I'll text Dr. King immediately and have it email it to me. Thank you, Dr. Hatton. Any questions on this item? Oh, in, re in regards to changing a lot of the titles on these, it was also uh, in order to fit a lot of the grants and a lot of the, the, the things that we were applying for. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, I think you all are approved as long as it's just a grant through the grant process. You know, uh, hopefully we get news in August. And, and if we do great, if not, uh, like Dr. Han says, do a little bit more balancing and, and go work within what we have. Any other questions? No, we're just looking for no, um, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation on one to one device initiative. Um, as you looked at that organizational chart, one of the things that I, I want to make sure that we um, continue to focus on, the district has been very supportive. The departments have been very supportive. I mean, you have great support from score, uh, just having this committee as well as the superintendent, everyone, in supporting, uh, and especially the IT department and the um, doc Mr. Fisher and Todd, you know, bringing in Chromebooks, bringing in app, uh, um, devices, bringing in Dell products, I mean, you name it, it takes a lot of manpower to get all these type of uh, configurations done for the district. And I, I just really want to thank them because it, it wouldn't be possible if, they, if we didn't have that support. And with that comes with a lot of uh, hard work. And, you know, we just opened the G Suite. Uh, it yesterday was the one of the greatest uh, teachers were like, open the G Suite, got to go to Google Sheets. You go to somewhere, Microsoft, you go somewhere else, you had Chromebooks. When you're able to do that, you know that behind the scenes someone did the work. And, and I, I want to thank Mr. Fisher and Todd and his team for making that happen. But here's your reports. You can look at them as departments. Uh, you can see how much we spent in 2015, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18. Um, if, and you can see that uh, one of the things that you'll see a little bit different this year is last year we spent uh, 4,696,000. This year we had 384. But keep in mind that last year we spent a million dollars in the second grade initiative. So for not having that initiative again, we, were very, very, we did very well for not having the initiative. Um, the, the opportunity to open more Chromebooks, 
uh, really um, a lot of teachers got uh, extra money from the federal fund uh, from the Mrs. Tolman and many of the departments and they definitely used it on on Chromebooks as well so you can see the total that we have spent in the last one two three four one of the questions was how long does these devices last you know we're hoping five to six years but keep in mind that in those years we spend over 20 um, almost almost 20 million dollars okay so just keep that in mind if you look at the second page you'll look at uh, by department you'll see your your amounts there by department if you look at the next page you'll see by devices how many are the devices um, so you'll get to see those reports as well and if you go to your following pages you'll see it by campus I think this is um, by campus many of the principals are investing a lot on technology and the ones that are not we're visiting them see what 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 can we do to help them um, increase their numbers but when they turn in their report there's a report they have to turn in it's on the last page on that uh, tab um, many of them came back and said man I didn't know I didn't have that many in fourth grade or I didn't know I didn't have any in fifth grade so here's your your total uh, amounts uh, for each of the um, devices that were purchased and this is the report that was done as of um, yesterday we finalized every single count we didn't want to give you a report for June I mean May 31st if the big bulk came now okay um, any questions on any of these reports any questions we're good okay presentation on online registration system yes. mr. Johnson Mr. Costa, yes. real quick, I'm going to have to excuse myself, but I did want to uh, make two requests. Uh, just to reiterate those program evaluation results uh, that we mentioned, Dr. Hatton, uh, on the, um, those three or four different initiatives that we had in the district improvement plan. And one other thing, if, we c if I can get a, um, or if we can get a listing of the, I know that uh, we've got some, a group of people that are going to the ISET um, next week or this week? East it, starting sorry. Saturday. Starting Saturday? Okay, great. Uh, the committee that's actually included in this packet, are those the members that are going or is it different people? Uh, it's different people. We, we send an invitation. At two teachers. We send invitation to the East uh, principals, um, teachers, some of the teachers, some of the administration, and then some uh, declined to go. Mm -hmm. And so we got an email from those that declined to go and those that accepted are able to go this uh, this weekend and part of their agreement is that they're going to be presenting in the ICIT bash mm, so they're going to be all presenting at the bash so th I know they're going to get enough to present we're, we're talking about 24 people that will be able to present at the ICIT bash wow. as well Ms. Um, Ms. Rubio what's the funding source for the group that's uh, going to the ICIT uh, it's different one is bilingual uh, one is title four um, one is um, I'm sure some are 211 just very few from 211 but m the majority is from bilingual bilingual okay. yes and if you look at the uh, US Department of Education they wrote a a framework for supporting uh, integrate educational technology integration among ELL students and one of those recommendations was to uh, make sure that the leadership the teachers are, are invited to national state uh, conferences yes, yes. Uh, just to follow up on that, because um, I think that making sure that we're in compliance with funding sources, of course, is always going to be very important. Uh, so I love the idea of them coming back to present, definitely at your bash, but also uh, how that's going to maybe dovetail into a separate uh, training or, or session with your bilingual teachers specifically so that you can cover your bases, because I, would, I feel a little skittish about it being so global and it being funded primarily by bilingual in order to be able to go to this trip you have to submit to uh, a form to the TA NOGA that's that you're gonna have this trip and it tells you how many people you're gonna submit and what we ask all our teachers and principals that go is to look to make sure that they go to the ELL sessions there's a high degree of sub pop trainings at these conferences mm -hmm. so first you have to submit 
and notify the NOGA and we'd actually send it to Mrs. Tolman letting her know ahead of time. And it has to be something that's documented. Mm -hmm. And then we have to show, okay, what did they do for attending? Okay, they're gonna present. Who are they gonna present? They're gonna present to teachers. So uh, definitely uh, making sure that that's something that we do district. We have over 873 bilingual ESL teachers and almost every single teacher in this district touches an ESL student. Um, we believe that if the leadership goes and the assistants go and the deans go, we strongly believe that they are going to provide that training to the teachers. And everyone that's going has really made an impact on their instruction uh, for technology. And I've seen it happen. And again, I, I, I think that it's a still a very great, uh, I think it's a great initiative and I definitely support sending people to go get trained and come back and turn it around. But when you're using primarily one source of funding, it's important to make sure that you align it back to how it's going to help direct uh, classroom instruction, especially for the bilingual students. I agree. Right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna excuse myself, Mr. Cross. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, board members, Dr. Hatton, uh, members of the audience. Um, I want to thank, to express my thank for the opportunity to have been able to research and create and uh, begin the process in the, uh, implementation of the online registration, that's part one, and on the screen there you see new student registration. Part two, um, returning student packet and I'll elaborate a little bit more in, in just a minute. And then part three, the eventual attachment of documents into eSchool on the information that's provided through the online process. Um, this project would not have been possible without the financial and collaborative so support that I've had from Mr. Fisher and Mr. Um, from Dr. Lee Garcia over the past five years. So gentlemen, thank you. And also I've had the support of Dr. Hatton and uh, Dr. Cuff and the AAs, and I appreciate the support. And I think it's critical to, to reiterate something important. Um, this project has had the involvement and, and input from a multitude of departments. I'm gonna name them all off because it's, it's important because in this registration process, these folks have been either directly or indirectly involved in providing for the the applications online and they are CFO's office, legal office, advanced academics, assessment, athletic, bilingual and thank you bilingual for uh, translation of the uh, forms, uh, computer services, dyslexia, federal program, food services, grants, guidance and counseling, health services, homeless, the technology department, migrant, parental involvement, PIN, public information, pupil services, records, special services, special programs, and state compensatory. Without all these folks working on this uh, together, we've been able to bring in together what, what many departments have been doing or schools have been doing. They've been doing registration, but some of them had this piece of information, and some had this piece of information. The basics were all there, but some were asking for this and some were asking for that, and putting it all together um, really put it all into one location and one, one place, and from there I'm gonna show you what those forms look like. I also wanna thank veterans Paredes and Lucio for being pilot sites. And the net result of this project has been the standardization and the enhanced opportunity for quality data. And me being in PEAMS, quality data is really important, along with quality data for the many other departments. In your packet, you have some information there, and, um, one of them called uh, registration by school, new registration. And I'm just gonna tell you what those three columns are. Uh, pending approval is a packet that somebody from the outside sent into, into the database. We don't know who, we don't know what the intent is. They may have been looking at it and thinking they wanna come here, but somebody has submitted. The next column is pending delivery, which means that person has actually shown up, they provided the necessary information, they proved that they're not a robot filling out this information online and it being ready to be processed. 
delivered means it's actually been placed in the equal. So, for example, Aiken has eight pending approval, which uh, waiting for the parent to show up or whoever to show up. They have none pending delivery, and they delivered 11 into the equal database for pre-registration for next year, and so on and so forth down the line. Um, you can see the total of 870 folks have submitted. Um, that was yesterday at 9.40 this morning. It's now at 8.82. And um, um, now I'm over almost 890 right now that have submitted forms um, and by campus. The next page after that is the breakdown by grade level, and obviously uh, you can tell that the bulk of it is at the lower grade levels, EE, PK3, PK4, and kinder, and with an uptick in ninth grade and a slight uptick in, in middle school, but the bulk of it is uh, at those levels. Now, I do want to reiterate something important here. The online registration for a new student didn't kick in until April 15th, so prior to that, parents were registering and we didn't make those parents come back and redo their application and do it online. We didn't want them to go through that whole process twice. So there are a number of students pre-registered that you don't see on that page that are already prior to the April 15th and I think that's important to delineate that. The next page that you have is um, returning student packet. And returning student packet is the packet that parents fill out at the beginning of the year. Paul Johnson shows up for seventh grade, for example, at the beginning of the year. The teachers are handing out the packet. Take them home to your mom and dad or your guardian, have them fill it out, and return it back to us. We went live with that yesterday. Um, I sent out over 30,000 emails yesterday, and um, we're printing about 11,000 letters right now for those folks that don't have email. Um, and I want to thank all the campuses for their push to getting email because at one point in time, we only had about 25% of the population with email. And that uptick right before we went with this project to about 73, 74% of the population with email. So that's exciting. Now, whether they all functional emails or not, we're not 100% sure, but campuses will be able to monitor that. So right now, at this point in time, um, registering process, um, 1,300 packets have been delivered by parents already from yesterday to now. That's less than 24 hours have gone by and that many folks have submitted their applications. Uh, 580 parents or guardians have started and this is live data right now. Um, two have been put on hold. I need to go see whether the campus is doing that or somebody in my office did that. And I only have 38 that I'm working on right now that don't have emails or addresses that are valid. And I'm fixing those as we speak. And we'll hopefully we'll have those out no later than Tuesday next week, try to go online and find out what's wrong with their addresses and so on and so forth. And you can see by campus where all that information is at. The campuses will be able to monitor this progress um, for the new student registration. Uh, we've been telling the, the campuses, uh, for example, I went to Montano. Uh, doing some training there with the data entry, talking to them. We called the parent right then and there, and it turned out that parent was coming from uh, New Jersey, and they were moving down here, and so we tell them, hey, hey, we're great, thankful that you're coming to BISD. We, we still need some more information from you. Bring in that necessary packet. So it's very important that the school look at the pending approval list so that they can follow up and call them and say, hey, thank you for sending in an application to BISD. We're really looking forward to serving you. Uh, by the way, you need to bring in this, you need to bring in that, and when can we schedule you in? So that part is there. Now, I do want to show you um, a student. I created a student at about 10.30 this morning, and one, two, three, four students have just been sent in behind me. Um, just so that you can see um, what is going to be created at the next phase. Um, starting sometime between the end of July and middle of September. And I'm just going to pick on a couple of these, but from the registration process, um, we can create 
a whole multitude of forms already electronically for, by the parent, and I'll zoom in in a minute. And this is one I created, so this is fictitious data, but everybody else that you see there is live data, so I can't really zoom into them without violating FERPA stuff. But let's just view the forms. And here's the economic disadvantage form. And I'll try to zoom in a little bit. There you go. Uh, just basically asks if you're a SNAP or TANF, no, no. And then if they answer no to both of these questions, it opens up this section here where they put how many of the household. And I just made up these numbers. And what happens with this information is with the section B there, computer services um, with some of their programmers are going to help me take that information and do the automatic lookup table for the economic disadvantage data for the parent and for the student, so that'll be automatically. We'll have a parent signature and date already there, so I don't legally, we already have that information. Here is a sample of the ethnicity form that's required every year, and that is dated and signed. Um, here is a district graduation plan, a compact, already to go for the, for the teachers, already signed off, checked off by the parent, and signed off by the parent, and by the way, I put dad as my signature, so that's why you see dad there. Um, the next one here is home language survey. This is important. I may up a language there, Farsi and English, and that's important because once it's submitted in the eSchool, an email is going to be sent out through the process to the bilingual department notifying them that this kid is not an English, English candidate, but rather it meets the criteria for being tested and this form uh, was provided and created for us by, by Mr. Rivera and his staff and, um, and it's there. So the question, these forms eventually will, will migrate over to be part of the registration process. So uh, let me go back. All right. Um, I can also come in and eventually what we're going to do, well, I'm not going to get into that, but eventually I can download the forms here and I can save them and I can email to whoever need them or I can attach them into eSchool. Um, very quickly, just to show you what the form looks like, I'm going to just preview what the parents are seeing. Um, I'm not going to spend an inordinate amount of time, but the, the important thing about this form is that no parent can submit until it's complete. So once that form is complete, then um, they can submit it into eSchool. So not until they submit, complete all the questions that are on there, um, will it be able to process and we can go into the different, different things. I just want to point something important out. Um, not everything is automatic, so if they say no here, nothing else happens, but if they say yes, we have built into this thing so that other questions pop up, and by the way, this is the migrant form, and if the parent answers yes, yes to those questions, the migrant department will get an email saying, hey, be on the lookout for this kid, this is a potential migrant that you might want to deal with. And on the fly, Spanish to English. They can start it in Spanish, or they can flip-flop back and forth. So without spending an inordinate amount of time going through each one, um, any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, one of the, I think one of the complaints, one of the complaints, one of the, I guess, uh, a lot of uh, parents out there uh, is in regards to having to bring in hard copies of different documentation that they're required to present, such as uh, like a light bill and stuff. Do, do we have the capability of uploading them to this to this process? We have um, down here, if they are able, they can upload the proof of residency. They can also upload, if they are able, their birth certificate. And because in the delivery process, we don't know who delivered and we, wanna, we want them to prove that they're not a robot, we still want them to come in and show us that so that we can touch and feel it, make sure it's a real document, even though it may not, may not be there. So, yes. So we allow them to scan in, if they are able, immunization records, birth certificate, and proof of residency. There I have a question on that. Ma'am? Yeah, I have a question on that. 
the reason that you want them to bring in because you want to make sure they're the ones that are submitting the documentation and not someone else. That is correct. And, and that's we something that we have to be very uh, conscientious about it and help the parents understand the importance of them bringing the document and not somebody else because that's where you have a lot of identity theft going on. And if it was brought in by computer and you never verify it in person, then you don't have a case against someone who's abusing and using someone else's identity. And that's the importance of having them come in with it. So, and, and that's a good point. They, they won't, the campuses will not proceed to the delivery and into e-school until Paul Johnson shows up and says, hi, here's my picture ID, I'm a real parent, here's the registration process. And if it's already scanned in and they verify it, they don't need to, they don't have to scan it in again or make copies of it, it's gonna be there. Um, the other thing that has been discussed, I mean, Mr. Oliveira and I had a conversation with Region 1, I had a conversation with TEA about the forms um, because of document retention and so on and so forth. The Texas Education Agency basically says as long as any of those forms can be recreated within the next five years from any point in time by the software, you don't necessarily have to print it out. So we're kind of marching, if you will, towards a paperless PRC will never, I don't think will ever be paperless, but at least some things will be so that when Paul Johnson migrates from, since we have a high mobility rate, let's say I go from Pace to Lopez High School from across town, all those forms, once they get attached, will travel with that child. So there won't be a big delay in terms of sending data. Yes, sir. <coughs> with all this information that you're collecting on uh, a particular student coming in and from their parents. Uh, and I know a little while ago we talked about security in terms of data. Wh wh how can we make sure we protect that data because, uh, and, and what are we doing? Again, uh, and that's a very good question. Um, PowerSchool is the company that owns eSchool and they're the software that we have. But the process is the parent fills out an online registration process, they have to have their own password, their own email. They submit, it does not directly submit into our internal e-database. So it's secure here. And then from that point, it's reviewed by staff and then afterwards verified that it's accurate, then it's moved into eSchool. So th the company has, has built in those safeguards and security. I don't know anything beyond the firewalls and how that works. Mr. Fisher can articulate to that, but um, that was one of our concerns. Uh, we want to make sure that those folks are not a robot. Um, I do want to say also just that you can see we do have links that are outside that the parent can jump to and read at their convenience. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, public input regarding items reviewed and discussed. Hi, good afternoon, parent volunteer uh, for SHARP now. Not a second. <laughs> I had to get used to saying that. Um, I'm here because there's a lot of concerns from parents regarding the online registration. I've been working closely with the families from the Buena Vida uh, housing projects uh, regarding transportation. That's a whole other story. Uh, and they're very concerned uh, because of the online registration, a lot of them don't have access to computers. So they're very worried on what it is that they can do. Uh, on top of that, we're part of the the campus is being consolidated, so they already kind of feel that they're being left behind, and then you're also throwing on the online registration, and I'm assuring them that even if we would have stayed at Resaca, we would have had to go through this regardless. Uh, I spoke to Ms. Mancha from the Housing Authority. I was very glad to hear that you, you're working with her as well. She's willing to do maybe some sort of event there. They have access to computers and help out the parents do the online registration so I just wanted to get with you guys uh, just you know don't leave these parents behind that don't have access to computers for example myself I have three with the district I only received two emails yesterday I'm missing one I don't know if it's because he's moving from elementary to middle school uh, I don't know if other parents have been affected by that 
Uh, but more than anything, I'm just here to let's, you know, let's not forget these parents. There's some parents that literally don't know how to read, which is heartbreaking. Uh, so they need help. Uh, so if we can either, or maybe I was thinking maybe, maybe an, an event at CAP, just something to, or, or at their schools, just yeah. something to help them out. Oh. Uh, Dr. Thank, you, thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Thank yes. you. Uh, Dr. Hatton, we will, we can set up some uh, lab dates and uh, invite the parents over and have staff there to help them uh, do the process. Whether it's CAB, because it's near Risaka, or we can, we can pick a mutual place. And next steps, um, actually that, that was just an amazing idea in regards to maybe uh, some uh, mobile or, you know, on-site, uh, have individuals especially, yeah, uh, registration, you know, we have the technology and <coughs> capability. I mean, I know that, that we have like throughout the county and uh, for the workforce, we have these mobiles that go to different places. They set up, you know, and actually that's a, a pretty excellent idea. Yeah, uh, on, on terms of next step, if, if we could, maybe at the next technology uh, uh, meeting that we would look at, uh, you know, district-wide Wi-Fi, you know, trying to uh, mm. uh, create, and also, uh, what, you know, certain campuses, you know, they couldn't be in it because they're too far away from the rest of the cities. You wouldn't be able to have a city-wide Wi-Fi and reach out to San Pedro and maybe even Lopez and uh, veterans because they're way out there, but what will we do in those neighborhoods if we wanted to, you know, broadcast a signal out there. Uh, and I'm not sure, but while we, the city managers and uh, Noel Bernal said he's committed to working on district-wide Wi-Fi and while he wants to do it, let's just grab it and get it done. Because uh, I know that uh, yeah, last year, one of the valedictorians at one of our schools uh, went to Cornell never had Wi-Fi and never had an internet at home the whole time they were in school. You know, I, th I think we, we were looking at 70% of our kids don't have internet at home or something like that. And uh, you can have a device, but it, you know, if you can't connect up the internet, it's like, you know, if you're in Houston and you're watching the Hardy Toll Road from the street, you know, below yeah. it, you know, it doesn't do you any good, you know. I know. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we need to really look at that and maybe try to, you know, bring in the city and ask them if they would just, you know, want to give us a little brief report on it. Yeah, I think uh, last time we met with uh, Mr. Vernal in regards to it, he was very excited in regards to our, the Smart City Initiative brought forth by administration. Uh, if we could, like, touch, touch base with them to see where they're at, you know, they even discussed maybe bringing, you know, their grant writers, our grant writers, and see who else could, could uh, power on it. So maybe we get an update uh, next time in regards to where we're at and, you know, uh, what we've done in regards to being a little bit more proactive with the city, with Mr. Bernal, with um, uh, GBEC, uh, Mr. Losoya, see if, uh, uh, you know, just an update in regards to where we're at. Any other next steps? No, we're adjourned. Thank you. Great meeting. Thank you all.